Hello, everyone, and welcome to A Thesis Theater with Tyler Swope. I am Erin Oss. I am one of the preceptors here, and I was lucky enough to work with Tyler on his thesis this past year. Before we get started on letting him kind of talk about all of his process and all of his findings through his research, I do have a few announcements. Well, really, just in addition to our usual regularly scheduled events, we do have another event coming up. I think it's on February 5th at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time. The uh, There will be a conversation, a roundtable about Serena Higgins' new book that, or that she's edited, The Inklings and King Arthur. So you are highly encouraged to tune into that as well to see some of the other work being done through Signum. And I think actually that is my only announcement right now. So we will get, well, I will quickly turn it over to you, Tyler. So your thesis is on free will and uh, fate in Tolkien's Legendarium, which is always a rather tricky topic at the best of times, which you have, you have sort of taken it on with aplomb. So would you like to, to talk about what it is that kind of drew you to this particular topic? What, what was your entry point or interest? Yeah. Um, so Tolkien has just been something that I've been interested in since I was young. Um, I think when I was 12 years old for a class, I was given a list of books that I had to read uh, or that I could read, I, I should say. And uh, then I had to do like a book report about it. And I just randomly picked one, The Hobbit, uh, and, and picked it up and read it. And uh, I, within the next just couple months, uh, I devoured The Lord of the Rings as well, and I just couldn't stop. And then by the time, I think I picked up The Silmarillion when I was around 14 and read it, and I barely knew what I was reading. Uh, but yeah, it's just something that's always interested me. Um, and always, I've always been drawn to, to, um, to fate and free will kind of questions as well. Uh, not only just like in our in in real life, I should say, uh, in our lives, but uh, in literature in general, it's always interesting to to see if things are meant to be. Because a lot of times when I read fiction, um, I'm turned off by something that seems to happen out of nowhere without an explanation. Uh, that's just my personal taste. And what I love so much about Tolkien is I've never felt like it wasn't explained, um, especially after reading the Silmarillion and, and, and seeing how he sets up uh, his structure of fate and free will and how that functions in his world. Um, it's just, like I say, it's just been something that's always interested me. Awesome. So you decided to take take that up as your primary topic for your thesis. And you, when you were researching it, what sorts of uh, what sort of study has already been done on the subject out there? What kinds of things did you find? Uh, I found quite a few things, um, and the common theme among all of them, because they all pretty much agree on a lot of things, but they only look at characters' decisions in the short term. And I understand why they would. I mean, a lot of these are things that are published not in book length um, forms, but they're just, you know, in other, you know, smaller scholarship. Um, and in the short term, it's easier to analyze because you're not stringing it out across the whole history of Middle Earth, which is kind of what I attempted to do with just a few characters. Um, and so, yeah, the, the research was was not super varied. Um, they all pretty much agreed on on the structure because I think Tolkien's pretty clear in the Aina of the Silmarillion. And um, so yeah, but there was there was quite a few I used. And in fact, there were, there were so many that agreed though, I just chose my favorites or the ones that I felt had the best information um, and ended up with probably 10 or 11, I think, in my thesis. But um, there were several more I probably could have used had I wanted to, but it would have been repetitive. Well, so you mentioned that they all sort of agreed. What were the, um, I guess, the, the primary theses of agreement that you discovered? Yeah. Um, so what they what they mainly agreed on was that in the beginning uh, of the Silmarillion, which I know that if you're watching this, you may not have read the Silmarillion. That's totally okay. Uh, I will try to explain some things. Um, but hopefully you have read the Silmarillion and we're all good and, and we don't have any worries and you understand what I'm saying. Um, so uh, Iluvatar, the creator of Ea, uh, which is the, the earth in Tolkien's secondary world, um, saying things into being. 
um, and then there were those with him, the Ainur, and they sang with him, and they were singing things into being. Um, and then, uh, long story short, Melkor wanted to destroy things with the music, um, and then some of the Ainur, including Melkor, went down to Earth to live as physical beings on the Earth called Valar. And these Valar just um, watched over the world, but there was a very clear plan. Iluvatar sets up a plan from the beginning. He even tells Melkor, essentially, not in these exact words, obviously, these are my words, but essentially what he tells Melkor is, you can do whatever you want to try to destroy things in Ea and disrupt my plan for things, but ultimately everything you do will actually work to accomplish my plans. Um, and so what all these scholars agreed on is that um, Iluvatar allowed his creation to make free decisions and uh, choose for themselves how they would live their life. But ultimately, these decisions would be weaved into the music uh, that he'd already sung into being, and his plan would come to fruition through the use of these characters' free choices. Um, so it's kind of like it's kind of like I had to do an exercise in believing two seemingly contradictory things in that there was a plan for this universe while there were free choice for the universe's inhabitants, um, which was, was fun to kind of wrap your brain around that one for, for a while <laughs> I worked on this project. So yeah, that's what they agreed on though. And that is the the fun of that particular debate always of of trying to hold those two things in your mind all at the same time. But you had some you had some pretty good examples that you were able to sort of examine more closely and and kind of see how this worked out in the world, right? So would you like to well I guess maybe before we get to that we should talk about some of a little bit more about how you approached your your topic and and what what you were what your approach was, what sort of methods you you used as you were incorporating all of this in okay yeah um well i went as far as like let me let me talk about the scholarship really quickly um because that was obviously a very important part and like i said i chose i, I picked um, a few that i wanted to use um obviously used all of tolkien's works that i that i could um and what i did is i knew this was coming up for a while and so i knew that i was going to need scholarship and so I had been putting a, a little bit of money back so that I could buy books because I knew that a lot of the best scholarship is that that's published in books and I wanted it um, kind of selfishly and so that I could keep it after I was done with this, but uh, which was a really great excuse for my wife. I could just be like, hey, this is for my thesis, but ultimately I wanted it too. Uh, but, but also like I knew that the book link works were, were going to be valuable to me. So I bought several books. Um, I went and used as many as many databases as I could find through Signum, um, borrowed uh, usernames uh, for some of my other friends that were still in their college courses, and they had some different databases at their colleges, and I was able to utilize that, print off some sources there. Um, and so I found my scholarship all over the place, and I only say all that just as an encouragement to uh, anybody who's going to be doing their thesis, just search like crazy. Uh, it's out there. People have, I mean, unless your idea is just like totally genuine, which congratulations, that's awesome. Uh, most things have been written about in some form or fashion. And so um, I definitely did that. I, I wanted to just mention that um, off the bat. But I also um, approached this, I approached my project through the lens of like structuralism. Um, as I already stated, that Tolkien sets up the structure for his world and the fate and free will and how those two interweave and, and interact. Um, he sets that up in the beginning of the Silmarillion. Uh, now, granted, that wasn't like the first thing he wrote, um, but however he did it, the genius that was J.R.R. Tolkien, he made it all work together seamlessly from the very first pages of the Silmarillion to the end of the Lord of the Rings and everything in between. Um, and so it, it's, I worked with that structure um, of fate and free will to, to look at the seven different characters that I chose um, and kind of examine uh, the way they approach decisions, examine if Iluvatar seemed to actively intervene in their life or passively intervene, um, 
but yeah, that's kind of how I approached it. Is that kind of the answer you were looking for there? Yeah, no, it does. And I think uh, structuralism is a, it's both a challenging approach to Tolkien because you are asked to put together these books. And in many cases, you could be drawing on poetry and half works, kinds of drafts and things like that, and to kind of all bring it all together and look at the, the overarching structure of so much work. So it's a very useful for understanding Tolkien's Legendarium, though, because you did have to cover quite a lot of ground. So I guess now that would be a good time to talk about that ground that you did cover. And you, you, you chose a few particular characters. So what, what kind of made you be drawn to specific characters for, and have to kind of cut out some other ones? Because there's a lot to a lot to work with in all of those books. Right. Yeah, I knew that this wasn't going to be, you know, a, a three, four, five hundred page uh, book that was comprehensive uh, and, and all encompassing. And I was going to come to definitive answers about each of these characters and how Iluvatar interacted with them. Um, I knew that's not what this was going to be. So I chose characters that I felt best displayed Tolkien's structure. Um, characters such as uh, I open up with Melkor. Um, for those of you who haven't read Silmarillion, I said earlier, he's, he's kind of, um, I guess you'd call him the antagonist. I mean, he is, um, the antagonist in a lot of ways. Sometimes characters who you think are protagonists end up being antagonistic. Anyway, uh, <laughs> Silmarillion is, is daunting in some ways, but, um, Melkor is the guy who you never see him make a pure decision. You never see him make an honorable choice, um, yet Iluvatar allows him to make those choices. He allows the, him to, to destroy things that are beautiful in the world, um, and yet in the end, if you follow things through, the, through the, the line of fate and free will that runs through all of Tolkien's works, without Melkor doing some of the things that he does, Middle-earth would look completely different. For instance, um, there, there are two trees in Valinor, where the Valar live, and these two trees give light to everything, uh, both physically and metaphorically. Um, and they essentially, like, they're not, they don't worship the trees, but they may as well be worshiping these trees and they give light. Well, Melkor destroys these trees. And it's, it's typical Melkor, it's exactly what, what they would, you'd expect him to do. Um, but this leads the Valar to ask Feanor, another character I analyze, to, um, uh, they ask Feanor to give them one of the Silmarils, which are these beautiful gems that, that hold the light of the trees of Valinor within them. Well, then he makes the free choice to refuse that. And because he refuses that, it leads the elves out of Valinor. He leads his group of elves out of Valinor, including Galadriel. Anyway, you can see it's just, it's a building blocks, one on top of the other. Um, and so each of these characters, which I can discuss a little more in detail later, each of these characters make choices like that, or at least prodded towards decision making like that, that end up affecting all of Middle Earth. And, and obviously, I can be very long winded about each of them. This is not exhaustive. I, I tried to choose um, very important decisions from each of these characters that display Tolkien structure. I wasn't trying to be comprehensive in any way. Uh, I was just trying to show that Tolkien's structure ran throughout his legendarium um, and that it was consistent uh, and that um, at the end I'll talk about how how that actually um, that has something to do like the eucatastrophe in Tolkien which is something that some people have an issue with. It actually makes perfect sense when you look at it through this structure. So you would, I think, need a very large book to cover all of that comprehensively. Yeah, no way. I wasn't doing that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe in the future. But well, so you you bring up you brought up Melkor in in with Feanor, but you also talked about Aule kind of along with Melkor. So could you kind of speak more about the the comparisons you made between the two of them and how looking at them next to each other was helpful? Yeah, definitely. Um, so Aule was another of the Valar that came down um, to the physical world with, with Melkor and the others. And Aule um, was a craftsman uh, and he wanted to create much like Iluvatar had created the physical world. Um, Aule though knew that the children of Iluvatar, uh, which were the elves, were supposed to be coming soon. 
um, Illuminar didn't didn't say when the elves were coming or when his children were going to be born, but all the Valar knew that they were on their way. Um, Aule, though, being impatient and, and really just wanting someone to care for, um, began thinking, what kind of shapes would the children of Iluvatar have? How would they look? And he started creating dwarves. Uh, and, and as he created these dwarves, uh, he was going to bring them to life. And, and he did. He brought them to life and created much like Iluvatar did. And Iluvatar allows the whole thing to happen. And then Iluvatar comes on the scene and is essentially, Ale, what have you done? Um, and Ale um, knows he's done wrong. He disobeyed. He, he, I don't use this term in my project, but he sinned in a way, right? Um, he did disobey, but it was out of impatience and a desire to love and care for something else, which is what they were all, all the Valar, aside from Melkor, were looking forward to about the coming of the children of Iluvatar. Um, but then Ale makes the decision. He grabs his hammer and he says, I'm going to destroy them because I've disobeyed you. And the dwarves cower in fear, showing that Aule did have the power to create them. Um, and Iluvatar makes them say, saying, like, they won't awaken until after my children awaken. So he makes the dwarves go to sleep um, until the children of Iluvatar are awakened. Um, and and what, why I juxtapose that with, with Melkor is because ultimately disobedience is disobedience. Aule disobeyed by creating the dwarves. Melkor disobeyed by pretty much everything he did. Uh, and yet, um, Melkor's decisions, his motives were pure evil. And what you notice throughout this, throughout Tolkien's Legendarium, is when characters make evil choices, typically in the short term, and, and most of the time in the long term, um, those characters receive their just desserts for those evil choices. Melkor ends up getting imprisoned at the center of the earth for, I don't even know, three three ages or something. I don't remember what it says. But he gets imprisoned. Aule, though he disobeyed, made the choice out of honorable, uh, you know, he made it honorably. He, he did it because he wanted to care and love for, for creatures other than the Valar like himself. Um, and for that, Iluvatar doesn't, the only punishment Aule gets is he has to continue to be patient. That's it. Um, he's barely reprimanded for that. And um, that's important because it not only shows that, that fate and free will make sense, these choices, even these Valar, which are like angels, um, are allowed to make free choices as well. Motives matter in Tolkien's world. Uh, and that's why, I, that's why Aule was one of the characters that I focused on and juxtaposed him with Melkor, because they're both Valar, they both make their own choices, they both ultimately disobey. So what was the difference? Why wasn't Aule punished? And it was his motive, and it was a pure motive. Which is a, a lovely thought, and what I think, I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, is what I think sets Tolkien apart from some of the other other fantasy authors. I think my example was George R. R. Martin, where you, you have events that occur, but the intentions don't seem to matter very much. Right, which yeah, is a little, it, it, um, it's not just about making sense at that point, right? It's, it's about the fact that it's, it's sense and a, a, with depth to it, I suppose you could say. Yes. Yeah. So, an excellent observation for one of, one of the strengths of the work. So you have lots of others though, so I don't want to just, just go here. You've got Feanor too. Do you want to say some more about his? Obviously Feanor is a key, a key player. Yeah, definitely. Um, and again, I, I'm kind of for, for these, these Silmarillion characters, I'll give kind of a, a brief like bio, we'll call it of them and their story so that, that we're all on the same page. Um, Fanor, um, was, was born, um, when the elves were shortly after uh, the children of Iluvatar were all born and, um, he lived in Valinor, Valinor with the Valar. So they hadn't even gone over to Middle Earth yet. Um, some had, but not all. And Feanor was born, and at his birth, his mother died. Um, and she she died, she claims, in the Silmarillion, because um, essentially, like, all the, everything that was within her went into Feanor. Um, he was, he was um, very, very skilled, 
craftsmen um, at a very young age, while the other elves would have been doing normal kid things. Um, he was learning how to craft. He was very driven because of the loss of his mother. Um, and he begins to craft things, and eventually he crafts uh, the Silmarils, which I've already mentioned, um, which are obviously important. I mean, the Silmarillion, the name of the book, uh, for those of you who haven't read it. Um, and and his, his father remarries, and he gets two stepbrothers, um, and then ultimately he won't give up one of the Silmarils, and then eventually Melkor steals the Silmarils from Feanor, and Feanor uh, declares an oath with his sons um, that he will not rest until um, until he gets his Silmarils back from Melkor, which they've renamed Morgoth in their language. Um, that's a really short bio, a really short synopsis of Fanor's story. But what makes Fanor interesting, um, and I'm actually going to turn there in my thesis so I don't misquote myself because that would be, well, that'd be frustrating, um, just so I'm checking myself. Um, Fanor, um, what's interesting about him, I, I typically, throughout this, I'm analyzing the character's decisions. But something that's interesting about him is that there's a lot of outside influence on his decisions, his mother dying, his father remarrying. Um, and, and, and things that have affected him mentally throughout his life, and they affected him in a big way. Um, it even says, um, it even says, in, the Silmarillion's narrator says this um, about, about um, Finway, which is Feanor's father, remarrying. And I want to read this because I think this is so important. The narrator says, if Finway had endured his loss and been content with the fathering of his mighty son, the courses of Feanor would have been otherwise, and great evil might have been prevented. Why that's so interesting is he's saying that Finway makes a choice here that affects Feanor so negatively that Feanor is fated almost to make poor decisions and fated to um, have evil things befall him, and which they continually do throughout the rest of his life after Finway remarries, because Feanor is so unhappy about it. Feanor hates, um, he hates his, his new um, stepmother. He doesn't like his stepbrothers. He doesn't get along with them. He doesn't understand them because they're much more gentle. He's very fiery and passionate about what he's doing, um, which is reasonable because he's, probably more intelligent, more skilled than, than any elf alive at his time. Um, and so it's just so interesting that, that these outside influences cause him to be who he is. Yet, at the same time, um, the bad decisions that he makes, such as not giving the Silmarils that he's created to the Valar to create more light, um, which eventually leads to their being stolen from him, um, decisions like that lead the elves to Middle Earth. They lead his group of elves there. Galadriel wouldn't have been in Lothlorien if it wasn't for Feanor and the Silmarils getting stolen. Um, which again, I assume everybody listening to this probably has at least read Lord of the Rings. Galadriel's very important <laughs> um, on so many levels. And so um, things like that, you can, you can draw a line from these decisions make, made very early on in these characters' lives that affect the rest of Middle Earth's history. Um, and so, like I say, Iluvatar is not making Feanor make any of these choices. He's not forcing him into any of these decisions. Other people's choices and, and, and happenstance and things that happen like his mother dying um, have led him to be very, be very prideful and to be very um, sure of himself. And because of that, uh, he also doesn't trust anybody else uh, not named Fanor. Uh, and, and that ends up leading to his downfall, leads to his sons making oaths, um, uh, and leads, it leads to a lot of bad things in the short term and long term, but they were necessary things. So his choices, motivated negatively by pride, as I said earlier, when, when motivations are um, have impure motives, like pride or anger or whatever, um, Typically in the short term for those characters, that leads to bad things, which the next character I'll talk about is Turin. And he's like the ultimate example of bad things happening to a character. We just talked about him before we went live here. Um, and, and so a character like Feanor, these choices were necessary uh, and they, they made things necessary to happen. But had he made better choices, had he given the Silmarils to the Valar, they may have still gotten stolen. We don't know. That's, we're, not, we're not dealing with that. 
Um, but what did happen is he didn't, and that led to bad things for him. He didn't live very long after his soul murals were stolen. Um, and so, anyway, just another show of that he's allowed his free choices. He's not made to make any free choices. His free choices actually work to um, to make sure that Iluvatar's plan is furthered. Yet, because his motives were impure, bad things happened to him and his family. Does that make sense? No, it does. I mean, and he at, at Finn, or I think we get to one of those more complex tensions, certainly that that we kind of mentioned at the beginning here, where you have that the tension between fate and free will, because as you say, he is he is fated in some ways, but he did have choices, and we can see that they they definitely do matter in in the context of the story. But the the most intriguing character, I think, for that tension is probably Turin. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I can talk about Turin. Um, man, Turin. Uh, again, a little short bio about him for those who haven't read The Silmarillion. Turin, um, man, one of, one of Tolkien's saddest characters. Mm -hmm. Just so incredibly sad. Um, if you can read Turin's story without being sad for him, that's, I guess that's on you. I don't know. I can't do it. And I've read it multiple. I mean, I, I read it for the first time when I was 14, like I mentioned, and, and it stuck with me. So I knew that I wanted to do something with Turin in this. Um, and what, what happens with Turin is um, if you've read the children of Huron of the Silmarillion, um, his, Morgoth Melkor lays a curse on, on he and his family, on Huron's family, which is Turin's father. Um, essentially to say like they will give bad advice, evil will befall them, all this stuff. Um, and honestly, we're not, we don't know if Morgoth has the power to do that or not. The narrator doesn't tell us. It's just, this is what Morgoth said to Huron. Um, but based on Turin's life and his sister's life, it seems to be true. So when Huron is captured by Morgoth, um, Turin is sent to live with King Thingol. Um, and, and so Thingol is essentially his, his, um, for lack of a better word, I mean, just like kind of his new father, um, his adopted father, really. And he's meant to protect him. Um, and, and Turin, his life, I talk about this in, in my project, but his life can kind of be divided into three different phases. And that's his outlaw phase, his phase in Nargothrond, and then his phrase, his phase as Turin Turambal. Um, and so what happens is in his outlaw phase, he makes seemingly innocuous bad choices that that a young man might make that was very confident in himself because he is very confident in himself he's very prideful i would venture to say just as if not more prideful than fanor in some areas because i mean he just he just is so confident in all of his decisions um because what makes him an outlaw is is his his enemy sayron i don't i think it's sayron or Siron uh, or something like that it gets confusing. Um, he he essentially has him flee from him, leads to his enemy's death, and rather than going back and facing King Fingal, his adopted father, um, he's like, I'm not going back. I'm just going to live as an outlaw in the woods, and I'm going to have an outlaw band, uh, which is every young boy's dream. And and that's what he does. And his best friend um, is a Beleg Strongbow, an elf that is... Um, is awesome. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. Beleg Strongbow is awesome. And um, in the end, Beleg tries to get him to come back. He doesn't come back. Um, ends up leading to Beleg's death at, at Turin's hands um, because of some of the choices he makes. Um, and then he ends up living in Nargothrond, which is like one of the last elven strongholds that is totally hidden. The only warfare they've ever engaged in is stealth. Um, they're very, very much a community where they don't want to be found out because it, that's against Morgoth. That is one of the strongholds that has held for so long. Um, once Turin is there, though, the advice he gives and remembering here, remember when when Morgoth told Huron that that they would give ill advice, give bad advice. Uh, Turin said, we should build a bridge over over the waters where, where you've hidden Nargothrond. Build a bridge over and make ourselves known to the world and go to open warfare. And they build the bridge, and they're going to go to open warfare. And then the, he has a chance when um, one of the other Valar sends emissaries to Nargothrond saying, do not do this. 
tear down the bridge and he has a chance to get rid of this prideful decision he's made because the only reason he made it is because he was, he could, because he was Turin and he was a stud um, in his mind. And so he has a chance to redeem himself and he doesn't. He keeps the bridge up, ends up leading to the destruction of Nargothrond, the deaths of thousands of people. Um, and yet he survives. He survives. And, and that ends the kind of the Nargothrond, the, the outlaw and the Nargothrond sections of his life. And then he, he go, enters into the Turambar section where he's, what happens in this section, um, he doesn't make a lot of choices besides killing um, Glaurung, Glaurung this, this dragon that, that helped destroy Nargothrond. Um, but he does fall in love with his long lost sister, but neither of them know uh, that they're siblings. And when they do find out, it leads to uh, that they both actually commit suicide. Um, and again, I skipped so many details, but I just wanted to give a little bio of the sadness of Turin's story. But what makes his story interesting and how it fits in with this project is that um, he, all of, he, all of his decisions um, are made with his pride. He he won't go back to King Thingol because he's too prideful. Because he's like, no, I know that Thingol will tell me that I was wrong, leading to or because my decisions led to the death of a guy that I consider my enemy. I'm not wrong. He deserved to die because I'm right all the time. Um, he didn't come back for that reason. In Nargothron, like I said, he he wanted this bridge built just because he lived in Nargothron now, and he thought that was the right idea. And he thought because he was there, it could never fall. Nargothrond could never fall. It could never be defeated. Um, and then just these kinds of decisions, he's allowed to make these decisions. And Iluvatar never intervenes. Uh, I don't even know that Iluvatar's name is mentioned in, in the section about Turin in the Silmarillion. I know it is in the Children of Huron, which is a little more detailed story of Turin. But um, he's just always there in the background, allowing those decisions to be, to be made. And Iluvatar is weaving these decisions into his ultimate story. There's a prophecy in the Silmarillion that says that Gondolin will be the last elven stronghold to fall to Morgoth. Um, but Nargothrond was actually better protected. And if Turin wouldn't have made the, the prideful decision to build, to tell the king to build a bridge, and to leave the bridge up and to go to open warfare, Nargothrond probably would have never fallen. And so it met that prophecy. And so there's all these different elements in Turin's story um, that, that, that had to happen. Now, ultimately, he could have made those decisions with different motivations. He could have made some slightly different decisions that led to ultimately the same bad things, but they wouldn't have been his fault. But his motives were important. His motives of pride and, and selfishness um, and hubris on his own part. He just, it's all hubristic decisions because he thinks he's the greatest thing to ever live. And, and it ultimately leads to the deaths of thousands um, as well as eventually his own death. Um, and so it's just another example, a lot like Fanor, where he's allowed to make his own decisions in the short term because those decisions were motivated impurely. Um, bad things happen to the, to him and those around him. Uh, yet Iluvatar still uses those bad decisions to accomplish his good goals. Could you, I mean, that's, Turin is, I think, the hardest character to see how it fits into that those greater goals and how it is for the ultimately going to work within Iluvatar's great, the, the song, right? The, his great vision, right? So could you speak more about uh, how that works, how you can kind of square what happens to Turin when he's got kind of Morgoth always affect, affecting his life and, and all of these terrible things happen to him, but at the same time, it works within this greater structure that you've laid out. Yeah, um, yeah, and, and I can't, it, he's harder to trace than, than some of the others. Obviously, Feanor's decisions were very easy to trace. Um, Valar decisions are easy to trace. We'll talk about Bilbo and Frodo, uh, clearly easy to trace. Um, Turin, it, it's less, I will admit, it's the least, um, it's the least long-term look that I looked at. It's the mo it's the most closest to the short term. Um, but again, I already mentioned the prophecy. Nargothrond had to fall. It had to. According to Iluvatar's, Iluvatar's plan, it had to fall. Um, his, his um, I believe it was Turin 
um, and him leaving home and leaving Thingol, uh, Thingol and Melian's kingdom, um, that it took Thingol to war to, to protect the other elves and brought him to war. Um, I don't know. It, it's harder for me to um, tease out the long-term stuff for Turin, but it's a great example of the motivation. Does that make sense? Like, and that's, and, and probably I, I probably, like I said, when I started this project, I was like, Oh, I'm doing Turin. So maybe I don't know that it was necessarily the best decision as far as looking at the long-term effects and looking at a Louvatar's plan. Uh, because the only thing I specifically mention um, in, in the project about Turin and the long-term plan was that prophecy and the fall of Nargothrond before Gondolin falls. Um, and that just goes to show that that was something that was that Iluvatar allowed someone to know and prophesy and it had to come to fruition. Um, but yeah, like I say, I, I don't know. It's hard for me to tease out why his story is so important in in the long run. Um, but it, he's a great example of, of how the structure fits together because his motivations were impure. He's allowed to make these free decisions um, and people are really affected negatively because Iluvatar allows the natural consequences of evil decisions to come to fruition. So that doesn't really answer your question, but <laughs> well no, it's how the, the events kind of turn out as they as they do and like that has consequences down down the line. Absolutely. Right. It's a significant part of history, those those falls yeah. and things. So yeah. And so we'll go uh, to Bilbo and Frodo, which is, of course, where all of these things are coming together in, in the, 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 that tale. I do, before we do that, just want to make sure everybody knows that if you want to ask any questions or anything, feel free to type them, and I'll make sure that we cover those at the end, too. But just for now, Tyler, do you want to talk about Bilbo and Frodo, which, I mean, The Hobbit is can be very difficult to fit into the same themes of the Silmarillion. So, but you, you went, you covered everything. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. And honestly, the, um, the exploring J.R.R. Tolkien's The Hobbit by Corey was a huge help in this um, mm -hmm. as well as I think it was the road to middle Earth. yeah, the road to middle earth uh, by Tom Shippey were to, very helpful in this because they defined luck. Um, since The Hobbit is a children's book, the term luck um, was used way more than fate or doom, as Tolkien uses it much in the Silmarillion. Um, it was really important to understand the luck because Bilbo continually is face to face with situations that he did not pick for himself. He did not make a decision to get there. Uh, he's just there. And, and he's the ultimate bystander in history. And yet here he is, and he's got a decision to make in the moment, but he wasn't. He didn't purposely put himself in that spot. Um, and a lot of it is luck, right? I mean, finding the ring, luck. Being in Rivendell on the exact date that they could read the moon letters, luck. Reaching Erebor um, on Durin's day so that they could see the keyhole and enter into the side gate of the mountain, luck. I mean, these things are all just things that were totally out of Bilbo's control, and yet they happened to him. Uh, and, and what I posited in my project is that this, this luck is Iluvatar moving um, Bilbo in the direction he wants him to go for the ultimate story, the redemption story of Middle Earth and the de ultimate defeat of evil. Um, I even put uh, just, I put like using Shippy and using Corey's um, definitions of luck. I said that the luck Tolkien speaks of is fate acting itself out in the physical world. Although each individual character has the free choice to embrace this luck and he or she bears the responsibility for their actions, whether they accept the luck or not. So it's just a Luvatar giving him a choice. Ultimately when, when Bilbo finds the ring, yeah, it, it's, he just kind of nonchalantly, not even really thinking about it, puts it in his pocket, but that's a choice. He chose to put it in his pocket. He could have left it there. Um, and so the, the three-fourths of, of in my project talking about Bilbo is simply talking about him being pushed towards this grand story and how he's, he's not being forced there at all. He wasn't forced out the door to go with Thorin and his company of dwarves to head to the mountain. No one made him go. He agreed to go the night before. Then he woke up. They weren't there. He was very happy. 
But then Gandalf shows up. He's like, you're late. And it even says in The Hobbit, Bilbo never quite understood how he'd gotten out of his house without his hat, without a handkerchief, all this stuff. Um, and he was heading towards where the dwarves were meeting him at the, at, I think, at the Green Dragon. Um, but, you know, that, that kind of stuff is, is Luvatar passively moving history towards something in Tolkien's Legendarium. He's not actively intervening. He's not saying anything. His name is never mentioned. Um, but that's what's happening. He's in the background working this out, pushing Bilbo towards things. Um, but Bilbo's story is not totally devoid of choices um, because Bilbo makes one of the biggest choices in Tolkien's entire Legendarium, in my opinion, um, and I'm just, again, trying to turn there. Um, and that, that's the decision to spare Gollum. Uh, in the, when he's got the ring on and he's following Gollum through the tunnels, trying to find his way out of the, go the goblin tunnels, um, Bilbo's considering killing Gollum once Gollum shows him where the exit is. Um, which, I mean, let's be honest, it, it makes sense. He, he, how else is he going to get by him? How, what's going to happen? He's thinking, I've got to kill this thing. And, and, and he knows Gollum wants to kill him. Um, and so, you know, it, it's interesting that he wants to do that. And, and it says that um, right before Bilbo is about to kill him, it says, a sudden understanding, a pity mixed with horror, welled up in Bilbo's heart. Um, so it's pity mixed with horror. He pity at, at this just terrible creature with a horrible life living under these goblin caves and then horror at the fact that he could possibly kill another creature. Um, and so Bilbo sparing Gollum is pretty easy to trace out in the long term. He spares Gollum. It's an honorable motivation. He doesn't want to kill a pitiful creature that actually, I mean, yeah, the creature wanted to kill him. So if he did it, like we could say that was reasonable and that was just and that Gollum deserved it. But Bilbo a pure motivation to not kill a creature that hadn't actually done him any harm as of yet. Um, that one decision allows Gollum to be at the cracks of doom and, and, and to be there to destroy the ring. Um, you, you, it's impossible to, to figure out how the story would have played out had he not been there. But because Bilbo had been moved to this point, and this is the not the only but one of the major decisions. I mean, I could have spoken about him stealing the Arkenstone and, and the stuff about that. Um, but again, not exhaustive. I, I intentionally skipped over some of those. I just felt that this was the easiest decision to show that Bilbo was still making choices, even though it appears as though luck, as the Hobbit calls it, um, is just moving him on towards his goal. We also have to remember that Bilbo is the, the narrator of The Hobbit, right? He writes his own story out. And so, of course, to Bilbo, all of this looks like luck. Um, I mean, what else would it look like uh, when you're captured by trolls and then the sun comes out just at the right time so that you don't all die? Even though Gandalf had a hand to play in that, but nonetheless, perfect timing. Um, so yeah, that's Bilbo. Um, that's what I wrote most about Bilbo, I think. Um, He's an example of both. And he's maybe the best example in my project of Iluvatar pushing a character, um, or not pushing, I should be prodding, gently prodding a character towards uh, decision-making that will affect all of Middle-earth. But at the same time, you have, I mean, so much of The Hobbit too is, is Bilbo's sorts of con inner conflict with different things. So it's part of that that you can't, you don't want to just kind of push that aside, which shows you the importance of his decisions, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. He, I mean, even, the, again, there's so much I could have, I could have talked about in this, but I felt like it would belabor the point in my thesis mm -hmm. uh, because I already talked about so many decision making things. That's why I just focused on the Gollum one. Mm -hmm. I mean, but even think about the decision to, to you know, how he decided to get the elves out of, um, or get the dwarves out of the elven kingdom, right? To get, uh, allow them to escape, and then all the decisions he makes on the mountain, and stealing the Arkenstone, and, and all of these things matter. Um, I just didn't write about them. Again, because you couldn't write a whole book, not yet, at least. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. But then you finally have Frodo, who is the accumulation of many of these decisions already made, and but he still yet has his own decisions to make. So what? how does Frodo fit into this picture? Frodo is, 
I mean, he's the ultimate example uh, of, of a character making choices. A lot of, I mean, Aule, um, we talked about Aule made choices that, that were still disobedient. Um, Frodo is just good. He's just good. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't have to make the decisions that he does. Um, when he finds out what the one ring is, what this ring that his uncle had left for him is, his response isn't, oh my gosh, what do we do? At first his response is, well, Gandalf, you take it, <laughs> right? He's like, no. And then Frodo, I mean, when he says no, Frodo's immediate response isn't, well, I don't want to leave home. It's so comfortable here. Can we get someone to take this? It's, well, I guess I got to get rid of this thing. I've got to find a way to get this into the right hands. Um, which is such a noble decision for a hobbit to make and such an unusual decision for a hobbit to make. Um, I think it made it easier for him because of, you know, we talked about Fanor's outside influences on his life. Um, the influence of Bilbo and the stories that he had told to Frodo, Frodo's entire life up to this point, probably made it a little easier for Frodo to leave um, and made it easier for Frodo to go on an adventure where a normal hobbit definitely wouldn't. Um, but nonetheless, Frodo makes the choice and he plans it out and he leaves. Um, and so that that's how it all starts for Frodo. He makes this choice to shoulder the burden. Um, but then what I focused on in my thesis are three major decisions that Frodo makes. And, and I feel like these, he obviously makes so many decisions, so, so, so many decisions throughout the Lord of the Rings that it, it might, it would take a book almost to just talk about Frodo and fate and free will, honestly, um, if you really wanted to look at just him. But I focused on three major decisions, and that was um, the decision to take the ring to Mordor when he's at the Council of Elrond, which has a few interesting things in it. Uh, his decision to leave the fellowship and take the rest, the ring the rest of the way uh, to Mountain Doom, um, and Sam comes along with him. Uh, and then his decision to trust Gollum when, when Sam and him finally meet Gollum. Um, and so I'll take those one at a time and I'll talk about those. This will probably be the longest I talk because I, I just think that this is the example of, of Tolkien structure. So if I get off track, keep me on the road, Aaron. That's, I'll know. do my best. <laughs> <laughs> That's hard to do, I know. Um, so the first decision, Council of Elrond. They're looking for someone to volunteer to take this ring. Um, we all know the line, Frodo's, Frodo's famous line, that I, I will take the ring, though I do not know the way. And uh, it's very theatric in the movie version. Doesn't seem as theatric in the, the book version. But um, that sentence, just this little hobbit, this guy that it, it, in every other hobbit's mind, in Sam's mind, Pippin's mind, Mary's mind, they've done what they were meant to do. They got the ring to Rivendell. They got the ring to the right people. Now the important people, the big wigs, are making decisions about what should be done with this ring. And then they're all bickering and fighting, and no one can decide who to take it. And, and Frodo's like, I'll do it. No one prompts him to make that decision. No one asks him to take the ring. He just volunteers. I'll do it. Um, and, and, and when he does that, um, Elrond says something very interesting. Elrond says... I think that th this task is appointed for you, Frodo, and that if you do not find a way, no one will. So Elrond, one of the oldest people in Middle-earth, one of the oldest creatures in Middle-earth, um, is able to kind of divine, like, I, I think, he doesn't know for sure, but he's like, I think this, this is your task, Frodo. I think that you volunteering was the right move. I think you're going to do this. And if you can't figure out how to do this, no one's going to be able to do this, which, I mean, think about the, think about the, the crowd that was around when Elrond said that to this little hobbit. I mean, mighty men, elves, dwarves, Gandalf, um, some of the, the, the mightiest people in Middle Earth were standing there and Elrond, uh, the wisest probably of them all says, I think this is for you, little man. I think you're the one that's supposed to take this ring. And if you can't do it, no one can. Um, you know, and that's just an astonishing thing. Um, and so Frodo making this decision, um, again, consistent with Tolkien's allowing his characters to make those decisions. But I don't even think I need to explain why this was a huge decision, why this was the ultimate decision with pure motives 
to go and destroy this ring for the good of all people of Middle Earth. Frodo knew he'd probably die. He knew in this moment that though it doesn't say it, there's no way that he didn't know that there's a good probability of him dying on this journey. But as long as he made it to, to Mordor and made it to the steps of, Kra the, the, of Mount Doom, um, as long as he made it there, it's all that mattered. And, and that is um, such a, a pure good motive. Um, and it shows how he's just, he's just so different from people like Turin or people like Feanor, where they're so prideful and made these decisions that um, led to long and short-term consequences that were so negative for people. Frodo making this decision, this one decision, I will take the ring, though I do not know the way, that one sentence ends up saving everybody in Middle Earth. Uh, and I think that's, that's uh, pretty awesome. Um, and a great example of, of Tolkien's characters making their own free choices and uh, leading to good things. It's like the it's like the trifecta. It's he's making the choice. It's a purely motivated choice, and it's going to further Iluvatar's good plan. Uh, and so that's like the biggest decision. Um, then we also see Frodo um, after Mormir tries to steal the ring. It really freaks him out, um, and he can see that the ring is having this negative effect on the party, obviously. And so he's going to go alone to Mordor and continue his mission. So instead of, you know, he could have given the ring to Boromir. He could have. He could have made the wrong choice. Um, he could have made this choice pridefully. He could have told Boromir, like, I'm the only one that can do this, not you. I'm the one appointed. I'm the chosen one. Right? He could have, but he didn't. It's a pure motive. He wanted, he made the decision to leave the fellowship because he thought that the ring was having a negative effect on them. Uh, again, pure motivation, a good choice that he freely makes on his own. Then um, Sam comes with him and that's great. But just that one decision itself, a lot of times we just, we can bypass that decision, but that decision allows Aragorn and Gimli and Legolas to go after Merry and Pippin, which allows them to go to Rohan, which allows them to meet back up with Gandalf in the forest of, you know, and, and all these different things. Um, they would have never, the fellowship would have just kept going on their journey just the way they were if it weren't for Frodo leaving. And Aragorn making the decision, we're not gonna follow Frodo, we're gonna let him go. And we're gonna go after Merry and Pippin. Um, so also very important. Also very important to expose, that exposes Saruman in the long run for what he is. Um, and, and ultimately leads to Saruman's defeat because Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli and all of them wouldn't have been there at that part of the world. They would have been in Mordor with Frodo if Frodo wouldn't have chosen to leave. Um, so the, that's the second choice. Again, good, pure motivation leads to good things in the short term and ultimately in the long term. Um, and the last decision, uh, Frodo comes face to face with, with I mean, some, some, it must have been like a mythical creature from his past, you know, his uncle's stories. He meets Gollum, right? And Gollum is so pathetic. And, and Gollum, Sam wants to kill Gollum immediately. Um, anybody who's read Lord of the Rings knows that Sam didn't trust him for a second, um, for good reason, but he didn't trust him. Think about though, when, when Frodo, just like Bilbo, who chooses to spare Gollum's life, Frodo makes the same decision, um, makes the same decision to spare his life. This decision is the only thing that even gets the ring to Mount Doom. They didn't know how to get into Mordor safely. They didn't know anything. And, and what's interesting is if they would have tried to get in on their own, they probably would have been captured and the ring would have been in Sauron's hands. Probably. We don't know that for sure, but, but it, it stands to reason. Because Gollum took them, tricked them nonetheless, but took them through Shelob's lair where, where Frodo almost dies and all you know, we all know the story. Um, but because Gollum leads them there, because Frodo trusts Gollum and is led there, that actually gets them deeper into Mordor than they ever would have been on their own. Um, and then also the obvious sparing of Gollum's life leads to Gollum being there at the end at the cracks of Mount Doom, uh, which is the ultimate destruction of the ring because that's the only time Frodo fails. He can't throw it in. The ring's done its work on him. It has turned him and he can't bring himself to destroy it. Um, which is a very human story that, that right, that, that 
sometimes, I mean, everybody fails. Frodo's not perfect. He, he gave in to the coercion of the ring, but um, he only got there with these, with these pure choices and these good choices um, driven by, like I say, pure motives. I can't say it enough. Um, and I get the most excited talking about Frodo with this subject because I think, I, and I think even think Tolkien knew that he was the example of, his, of fate and free will coming together. He was, he didn't need to be moved or prodded the way Bilbo was because Frodo made all the right choices throughout here till the very end, in which case he still ended up doing it because sparing Gollum was the right choice previous to him not being able to throw the ring in, if that makes sense. Um, so anyway, that Frodo is the culmination of this. Frodo is Tolkien's structure. He is the purely motivated character. Um, he makes his own free choices, and those free choices are seamlessly written into Iluvatar's story. Um, and so, yeah, I think I think that Frodo it, it he makes sense with everything Tolkien wrote to be the hero. Um, and, which actually leads me to my, to kind of one more thing I wanted to say. You know, I mentioned earlier that one of the conclusions I have about all of this is that you catastrophes make sense in Tolkien's world. I'm not going to say that things like you catastrophes make sense in everybody's fiction because I don't think they do all the time. It kind of annoys me sometimes when I'm like, wait, how did, okay. So the Eagles just arrived. They, they're just here now. They're just, they're going to say that. Oh, cool. Oh, Gollum just happens to be there and he's going to bite the ring off. Well, that's really convenient. Oh, the Eagles show up again. Oh, okay. Oh, the, it, it's always the Eagles. Uh, but but these you catastrophes make sense when looking at Tolkien's world through this lens, because the you catastrophes are possible because of the choices of these characters. The characters make the ultimate choices. Um, Gandalf, the, the eagles are able to be a you catastrophe and save the day because Gandalf saved their king from death at one point. A pure good choice that Gandalf makes all on his own that we don't even really know the whole story about, I don't think, unless it's written somewhere that I haven't read. And, and leads to the Eagles being willing to come and save these people, save Frodo and Sam, save the day at the Battle of Five Armies in The Hobbit. Um, and, and so the choices these characters make are weaved seamlessly into this story. And ultimately, you can trace these you catastrophic events that happen throughout Tolkien's Legendarium to a choice that some character made at some point. Uh, it may not be easy. It may be a really daunting task to trace that backwards. Um, but it's there because it makes sense. And, and so these you catastrophes aren't um, cop outs, which a lot of people like to joke. They're not cop outs that Tolkien did. They make sense and, and they follow his narrative and they follow his structure um, from the very first pages of the Silmarillion to the end of the Lord of the Rings. So. I was going to ask, what do you think you you gained from this study? But I think you've already said that quite beautifully. So I don't, I don't, I don't feel the need to retread that because yeah, the the intricacy of how the all of these stories and decisions are woven together to culminate in that final moment and that that success, that victory, right, is yeah. is I think one of the the strengths and beautiful things to appreciate here. I do have a few questions from that we want to cover, and we are kind of very low on time but i'll, I'll okay. address Sorry. these and this first one i think if i recall correctly was a, a question that you had asked early on in your study it was this is from tim fisher who asks that he's always he has read Flieger as rejecting that there is free will in arda the music determines all particularly in the silmarillion and do you agree and if so how do you answer her yeah, so we did ask that question, uh, and and I remember saying, <laughs> I remember that because that Flieger was oh man, I'm glad he asked this question because I remember this discussion. I'd forgotten we'd had this discussion. Um, yeah, I was worried about my entire project because I was like, oh my goodness, Verilyn Flieger doesn't agree with me, um, and and that's really scary because Verilyn's a lot smarter than me, uh, without question. Uh, I I would just say to that. Um, that she thinks it's all kind of predetermined. I just don't know how that that is possible when you look at a story like Aule. Uh, Aule clearly makes this choice to to create the dwarves. It's clearly his choice. He's going to make the choice to destroy them. He makes the choice to not to. The, I can see her argument if you're talking about elves and, and humans, and if she wants to make that argument, I mean, that'd be for another discussion. 
But I mean, if Valar are able to make these free choices, um, it just seems to me that um, that the elves and the humans are too. Now, I know that that it says in the Silmarillion that elves cannot change their fate, uh, yet humans can, right? Um, humans and other things, all other things, but elves, the children of Iluvatar, cannot change their fate. And I addressed that in my thesis a little bit. Um, specifically about Feanor that, you know, I mentioned the line where it would have been different for him. That doesn't mean that, that his fate would have been different. The music is written in the elves. What happens to them is going to happen one way or another. Um, but they could have a different trajectory to get there with their decisions. Um, and like I say, ultimately it's just an opinion through observation. Um, I can totally see why, why, uh, Miss Flieger thinks that, and and again, she's smarter than me, so maybe she's right about it all. I don't know. Um, but just to me, reading this, I can't help but but see things like Frodo and see these choices that he's making. Um, and man, I just can't imagine those aren't his choices. That is Frodo from start to finish. He's a consistent kind of character. Uh, the bad decisions that Turin makes, he's very consistent with his bad decisions, his prideful motivations, um, and it just. It just seems that Iluvatar, if, if, if the end of, of Iluvatar's story is a catastrophic story where, where the, the elves and the humans, all of Middle-earth is saved and, and evil is conquered, what was the point? If the creatures can't make their own free will and the music is determined at all, what was the point? What does Iluvatar gain from that? He wrote a good story? Okay. But isn't it even more impressive is he, if he's able to weave that the choices these characters make into his music? And so for me, I think it's just a difference of opinion with with uh, Miss Flieger, and that's just how I'd answer it. I, I just I can't come to grips with the music um, being able to do everything, especially when um, Iluvatar says elves can't change their fate, but men can. If men can change their fate, if there's any race that can change their fate, that means that the music is not all encompassing of everything. And the music doesn't determine everything for every character, if that makes sense. Uh, yeah, that's, the, that's always going to be the tricky part in this particular discussion too, and, and how you're going to define the two. And, and I think pointing to the decisions and the consequences of them is a, a good way to kind of see how it can matter, right? And the, the importance long-term there. And I, I see down here, Carl Hostetter, you have said, Berlin holds not that there is no free will in Middle Earth, but rather that only men have free will and that elves do not, and that he disagrees with her on this too. So, that's you're right. not alone. It's been a minute. I hope, what, I, yeah, this is a long time coming. When did I finish this? August? So it's been a while since yeah, I've been, read this So, yeah. But yeah, that, it's, the humans, certainly, right, they have the, the, that line that you, you've cited there, I think is very strong for that. But yeah, I think you, you've made some compelling cases. I think though ultimately it's, it's much like the just general ph philosophical tradition of fate and free will is always going to be one of tension. So, mm -hmm. which is perfectly cool. fine. That just means you have more papers to write in the future, I think. Right, that's right. And because we are sort of running running low on time here, I think that will have to be our, our final question, which is where where would you like to kind of go with this project? What do you see in the future? Any other questions you'd like to um, follow through with? Yeah, um, you know, I, I don't know for sure. Uh, I know that, you know, Tim's question from earlier is something I, I would like to look into, specific, what, like specifically looking at elven characters and human characters. And if there is a definite difference in, in the decision making and how those decisions lead uh, logically to their fates. Um, I think that would be a lot of fun to look at. Um, and I think that, you know, like any one of these characters like the, the, could be looked at way more in depth than I have. It's not comprehensive. It's not all encompassing. It is, it is, um, you know, it's not a book. It's it's my master's thesis, and so I I wouldn't mind just delving further into this exact subject, um, even further, and looking at other major characters because there were several characters that I that I cut out that I think are also great examples. Um, 
uh, of my thesis and, and, you know, like Tor and uh, Gollum himself, I could write a lot about. Um, I say it's something that interests me. So, so staying in this this vein uh, will probably be my next project, whatever that may look like. Uh, either this or Neil Gaiman. I don't know, one or the other. I really also, like, a good choice. <laughs> really like Neil Gaiman. So, well, excellent. Well, I look forward to any future work that you do on this subject or on Neil Gaiman because I also enjoy his work. But thank you for for talking with us today. And I guess, well, well, your, your thesis should be available in the library. If not now, it will be soon, I think. So, so you guys should have all, all have access to that if you would like to read through it more closely. And otherwise, thank you very much, Tyler. All right, thank you, Erin. And thanks, you, thanks to everybody who, who watched. I didn't expect such a showing. So you guys are awesome. Thank you. Okay, farewell, everyone. <laughs>